the context of the campaign against blasphemy laws is that it is absolutely central to the, the, the campaign for secularism. And secularism is a force for good for the same reason that religion is a source for bad in that secularism protects our laws from being corrupted by the immoralities of religion and particularly protects our laws from being corrupted by the bigotry and misogyny and homophobia of the Abrahamic religions, all of which uh, worship the same God, um, one of the most malevolent creatures ever invented by humans, um, a God who in, in its original iteration in the Old Testament, his core message is to tell one tribe that if they obey his rules that he would help them to kill other people and steal their land. That God was then refined in various iterations by Paul who gave us Christianity in the New Testament, by Muhammad who gave us Islam, and the Quran, and more recently by Joseph Smith who gave us Mormonism and magic underpants. <laughs> so the, the second thing that those religions have in common, as well as following a God that once drowned everybody on the planet apart from one family because he's upset with himself, is that they believe that they and only they are right. And they base that on various books, depending on which version of the God that they follow, that people have written thousands of years ago. And so unlike atheists, they're not able to say, as we are, that if you give us new information, we change our mind, that we're happy to say about any assertion that we make, that we may be mistaken. And we're not going to fall back on claims of divine revelation, or we're not going to fall back on blasphemy laws to protect the knowledge that we have at the moment. In medieval times, blasphemy was about protecting the community from things that individuals did that angered gods. And it was about protecting the community from the wrath of the gods. Um, then during the Enlightenment, the rights of the individual took over. And people recognized that, that individual rights to freedom of expression and conscience were more important than subjective opinions about deities. But we are now, unfortunately, regressing back to a situation where people are redefining blasphemy to protect communities. Except this time, it's not protecting communities from the wrath of God, it's protecting communities from being offended or being outraged by other people saying things that they disagree with. And instead of um, trying to get people to react proportionately when people say things that, they, that disagree with their fundamental beliefs, blasphemy laws encourage people to be outraged and offended because it creates an incentive to express that outrage and that offence. Most recently that's been expressed in the Irish philosophy law. Now there's a load of problems with that, which I'll go into later on. But the, uh, for, you know, for the moment, the principle that, that's significant is that it is a new blasphemy law introduced in the 21st century by a pluralist Western democracy. Despite that, it's, it is fair to say that in, in, in Western democracies, that, that blasphemy laws in recent decades have been you know, more or less confined to satire and humour. Uh, you know, things like the um, Life of Brian, which was banned. More, more recently, the, the uh, attempts to take blasphemy charges against Jerry Springer, the opera. But the difficulty, even though those laws aren't often enforced, is that just having them on the books, you never know when they're going to be enforced. You never know when somebody somewhere is going to decide that their conscience uh, is dictating to them that they have to enforce some theological law or other. Now, in Islamic states, it's far more dangerous. Uh, it's, it, it's just such, such a different reality. And unless we think of it in terms of, unless we tempted to think of it in terms of sort of hypothetical situations, I mean, later on, most of us will be here, I hope, to, to listen to Taslim Nazrin, who um, has been forced into exile and has had several death threats against her on the basis of blasphemy for her poetry and her autobiographies and her novels. And it's, um, 
you know, I think we should be inspired by her presence here today as somebody who is, is standing up to that type of intimidation. There are a couple of other cases that I would like to see people here be aware of and campaign on. There's a case of an Indonesian civil servant called Alexander Ann, who wrote on his Facebook page that God doesn't exist. And the following day, at his workplace, his fellow civil servants attacked him and beat him up. And uh, the police then came, and instead of arresting the people that had beaten him up, arrested him, and he was charged with blasphemy. There is another case, uh, a guy called Hamza Kashgari, who is a Saudi poet, who was charged with blasphemy after writing uh, some tweets on Twitter to the effect that if he met Muhammad, he would shake his hand as an eagle. And uh, he was told in no uncertain terms that he was under threat of being arrested. He tried to flee the country. He, he got extradited back and is, has been put under pressure. To, he's a Muslim. Uh, he's been put under pressure to re re uh, recant that uh, apostasy. We've had um, Pakistan just recently uh, closing down Twitter for a few days after the Draw Muhammad Day thing came up again. Um, it's really it's, it's the, one of the key battlegrounds really at the moment is the internet. It's one of the key places where, where this battle of freedom of expression versus censorship of conscientiously expressed views is being played out. It, um, it actually reminds me of in the mid-1990s when the internet was just catching on and uh, at least the World Wide Web was. I remember an, an, an Irish politician in County Cork was quoted as saying, the internet must be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> There's another case at the moment in Kuwait. Um, again, somebody accused of insulting Mohammed and the leaders of, of um, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain on Twitter. And whether it's coincidental or not, uh, frighteningly, this week, just this week, we're in the middle of a process where the, where the, um, the Kuwaiti government are passing a law increasing the penalty for blasphemy from imprisonment to death. So, you know, we're, we're really, this, this, this whole battle is being played out very, very seriously and very, very fundamentally as, as we speak. Again, look again, by the way, at that particular crime, which, which is, is, um, is insulting Mohammed and the, the rulers of Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and Bahrain. And it gets to the heart of what blasphemy charges are used for in, in, uh, in all cases, really. I mean, going back to, to the book of Exodus, when you were told not to revile God as the leaders of your tribe, is that... Blasphemy laws are used not to protect theology. They're used to prop up uh, political positions and they're used to suppress opposition and to suppress free thinking. The next thing I want to touch on is the, the overlap between blasphemy and apostasy laws in, in, um, in Islamic states and, uh, and how they affect Western democracies. And the ones we'd be most familiar with obviously are the, the, the Danish cartoons, um, maybe going back as far as uh, the Salman Rushdie thing would be, thing most, would be the incident most people would probably feel that like this, this recent spate of uh, fatwas and, and, and attempts to influence things outside the Islamic states began. Uh, but it's not, it's actually gone back, it's gone back further than that. There, there's an incident which, which I find fascinating, which is that in, in 1902, the, in, in New York, there was a new courthouse building being built in Madison Square. And as part of it, on, on the roof, on the balustrade of the roof, they, they had a series of statues, some of which represented abstract things like uh, wisdom and justice and, so, and the seasons, and some of which represented individuals uh, who had been part of the history of lawmaking from Hammurabi to Muhammad, Moses, King Alfred the Great, uh, Confucius, a whole series of statues representing different traditions in, in the history of lawmaking. And in 1955, when those, the, the, the building was been renovated 
and as part of they were renovating the statues and the story was in the, the media. And suddenly a whole lot of Muslims realised that there had been a statue of Muhammad uh, for 50 years on top of this building. And the governments of Pakistan and Indonesia and Egypt complained about it and said they didn't want this statue renovated, they wanted it removed. And the Americans removed it. And just left it there with a blank plinth, an empty plinth, alongside all of the other statues. So it's going back as far as the 1950s that uh, the Western states have been um, placating this type of oversensitive uh, expressions of, of being offended. Um, there, there was another case in the, in the 1970s when, when the New York Times published an article about Islam and they illustrated it with a reproduction of a, a Persian miniature painting of Gabriel appearing to Muhammad. And again, there were complaints about that and two days later, the New York Times published an apology for offending any Muslims about that. In 1977, um, a group of Islamist extremists um, took over some buildings and took hostages and murdered one person and shot others in Washington um, for a number of demands, one of which was to, uh, to have a film banned about the life of Muhammad made by a Muslim which included, uh, which didn't even include any images of, of Muhammad. They, they had done it on the basis of showing the film through the eyes of, Ma of Muhammad or through his, those of his relatives. So he didn't even appear on screen, but they insisted that it be removed. And, and uh, it was removed from a lot of cinemas in, in America. Um, in, in one on its opening screening, it was, it was closed down mid-viewing. As Muhammad was on his way from Mecca to Medina, the screen went blank, and people were told that they had to get out of the cinema. So it's been going on back that, back that far, late 1990s. Uh, Nike brought out a shoe with a, a swirl logo that was meant to represent fire. And uh, several Muslims decided that it looked too much like the symbol of Allah. And so Nike removed it. A couple of years later, Burger King, that um, bastion of Islamophobia <laughs> wrote out a, um, an ice cream package with a swirl on it. Again, it was deemed to be too like the symbol of Allah and Burger King um, surrendered their ice cream um, swirl. So that kind of nonsense has been going on for decades. It, it's not a recent thing, although what has been uh, more significant recently is the, the level of violence that has been accompanying uh, the, these, um, these attempts to, to, to have Western society change to, to, to uh, suit their sensibilities. The, uh, the Danish cartoons, with their carefully orchestrated, spontaneous demonstrations of outrage, <laughs> where suddenly everybody all around the Muslim world went back to their inexhaustible collection of Danish flags at home and brought them out to burn. <laughs> um, and then there was the, the case of the Swedish cartoonist a couple of years later, of drew, drew a cartoon of, of Muhammad, uh, Muhammad's head on a dog's body. And um, if you don't remember the riots and outrage about that, it's because they didn't happen. And it shows again just how, how orchestrated and selective it is. It's not spontaneous outrage. It's politically organized uh, pressure um, by Islamic governments and Islamic extremist groups. Uh, you also have the other more recent incident where, where the, uh, the Pope quoted an ancient uh, Byzantine emperor as saying that Muhammad had brought only things that, that were evil of anything new that he had brought. And, and again, despite multiple apologies, or attempts to apologize by the, the Pope, uh, the, um, there were riots on that one, including an Italian nun being murdered in Iraq. And uh, again, this episode, just as an, as an aside, given that we're talking about the Pope and the Vatican, um, the, they have quite, the, the Vatican have, in recent years, taken to uh, uh, prefacing every reference to atheists or secularists with the word aggressive and have uh, 
and have recently started saying that atheists are not fully human. The most senior person to articulate that is Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor on the BBC a few years ago. And the um, but the significant thing about that is 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 we, we you know we don't react by threatening to burn down the Vatican. You know we're, we're quite happy to let people say stupid things and argue rationally against them. And it's it's what's most significant about the, the these. Uh, Islamic responses to things that, that, that they uh, disagree with is that they're always accompanied by the, the threat of violence. And that, that's why people back down. You know, it's, it's not because of any great intellectual coherence in, in what the, the Islamists are saying. It, it's, it's because it's, it's accompanied by the, the um, take the, the Wild West analogy of the, uh, the final rule of poker. <laughs> Which is that a Smith and Wesson revolver beats four aces, <laughs> and uh, and that's that's really how it happens. You know, people people back down and businesses back down not because they agree with them, uh, but because they're afraid of them. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about the how things are working in the opposite direction now, because there are some positive signs where Western democracies have been having some influence. Particularly in, in, in trying to rescue individual people who, who have been, uh, you know, high profile people who have, been, who have been arrested on blasphemy charges in Islamic countries. And particularly in recent times in Afghanistan, where there's the new constitution that was put in with American assistance, has unfortunately got parts in it that allow people to, to be tried by Islamic law, including death penalties for, um, for apostasy and blasphemy. And there have been a couple of cases, one in which they, they, they got a pardon for somebody that, that had been arrested on one of those charges and he got out of the country was what, to, to, um, to Italy. Uh, but as well as that, there's been a constant battle going on for the last uh, over a decade at the United Nations, where the Islamic states have been trying to get international rules uh, combating what they call defamation of religion, really what they're talking about is defamation of Islam. And they started off with defamation of Islam, and have just changed it for political purposes to defamation of religion. And they have been getting those motions passed, they're non-binding resolutions, but they've been getting those motions passed every year since the late uh, 1990s. Um, up to last year, up to last year, for the first time last year, there was enough pressure for them to realise that they weren't going to get away with it and they didn't put, they didn't put the motion forward that time but instead they negotiated a, a, uh, a resolution that, 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 that reframes what they're trying to do uh, in, in terms of um, uh, hatred of religion and hate speech laws which is what they're now trying to, to have outlawed. But it, it's, it's, not hate, it's, it's not hate laws in the context of, let's say if you take the, in, in America where there, there, there are hate laws or hate crimes, but they're, they're an existing crime that is accompanied by a, a uh, hate motive. But they don't just have crimes in terms of, of expressing hatred. Um, and the, the Venice Commission, uh, which uh, is, is a, a body that, that advises uh, a, a, uh, states on constitutional issues in 2008 on, on, in a report that they made on the balance between um, freedom of expression and freedom of religion have said that there should be no more blasphemy laws, blasphemy laws should be repealed where they exist, they shouldn't be reintroduced and that, um, and that these issues should be dealt with through um, incitement to hatred laws, including incitement to religious hatred. Now I think what's important if, if governments are going down that road is that there should be a clear distinction be, between uh, hatred of people on the basis of their religion, which, is, which I think is wrong, and hatred of religion itself, which I think is quite acceptable. The, the idea of protecting ideas as opposed to protecting individuals is, is where, where I think we have to draw the line. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the Irish blasphemy law, but what I think I'm going to do, just in terms of time, because we're coming up to um, to twelve o'clock, is is I'll stop now and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the Irish blasphemy law during the questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>